Right. I think Bismillah, we start. Bismillah rahman rahim Well, Anna, first, Jazakallah Khan for joining us. I know it's a precious time, but uh, it's really appreciated. And I hope we have uh, sort of some discussions uh, along the issues of the crisis that we face ourselves in. And I suppose to start off with, maybe we can discuss how to bring about the spirit of Ramadan in lockdown now that our masajids are closed. We can't go to masjids, we can't sit in majlis uh, or tafsir. But how can we try and bring, revive that spirit of Ramadan uh, in our homes during this month? Well, firstly, uh, Jazakallah for the opportunity and it is um, a wonderful uh, opportunity and it's a wonderful feeling to be able to interact with people almost across the continent uh, we, we thank Allah Ta'ala for that, and we hope that, inshallah, we can benefit from this. Uh, you know, the, the two aspects with regard to Ramadan, which, which is quite interesting. One is intensely individual. Yeah. I mean, if you look, for example, the aspect of fasting, and that is why there is a narration that speaks about this fact that um, the angels go to Almighty Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala when a person is fasting and say, that how do we record this good deed? He's not doing anything. He's staying away from things. Yeah. It's not like he's read two rakats of salat, which can be easily, easily recorded. Uh, how do we record the reward of someone who is doing something, uh, doing an obedience to Almighty Allah by staying away from something, not positively yeah. doing and engaging in something. And the Almighty says, and of course, a very famous hadith, Asomuli wa ana adzibi o wa ana udzabi. Fasting is for me and I will reward it or I will become the reward of the person who is fasting. So on one hand, it is extremely uh, uh, right. intensely individual. And yet at the same time, there are also aspects of collect collective nature. So the, the, the fasting, the, besides the fasting, the Tarawi prayers, the congregational prayers, the Tarawi. Now, we have many a times in, in our Ramadans previously, uh, we have emphasized uh, maybe towards the more congregational aspects. Yeah. So we used to do our iftar together. We used to do our taraweeh together. We used to sit in the lectures, whether it be after Asr in UK or after Maghrib or after Isha in South Africa, according to the times. Um, now there's a time for us to perhaps look at the other aspect of Ramadan, the intensely individual relationship and building of relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sure. which Maybe many of our ulama surprisingly have been telling us. Now, yeah. you know, uh, very interestingly, Ismail, well, let me just say that there has been this uh, uh, discussion amongst ulama that should we be having congregational uh, programs in the masjid in Ramadan? Does it take away from the, the essential right. objective which is for a person to make ibadat on his own? Yeah. Uh, and of course, many of the ulama used to say that um, uh, there isn't that uh, capacity in today's time. So uh, if there is a congregational um, atmosphere and environment, people will seem to in, be able to readily perform ibadat. Yeah. Uh, and many of the ulama used to say the ideal is that you must make ibadat on your own. And that is why uh, Nafil Salat, for example, uh, the ideal situation was to, to, to go into Nafil Salat and perform it at home, your, your Nafil, and your, after your Faraz. Yeah. Over the years, we have become accustomed to the congregational aspects. So I, I would say that um, there are two aspects, and maybe here is a time for us to to build on that, make our, our I homes. I suppose on the private aspect, uh, we're talking about itikaf, uh, really the idea of solitude and reflection. And this is something, but I think because of the psychological feeling that you've been imposed to stay in your home rather than by choice, and I think we need to be able to differentiate that and how to bring in uh, or to benefit from the lockdown that has been imposed upon us and change that into a positive. Yes, I, I, again, I normally make this point that uh, uh, we should not allow what is not in our control to do what is in our control. I've been making this uh, mm. and uh, saying this quite a bit, but there are certain things that are not in your control. Now, whatever the reasons, and, uh, and we all know the different types of uh, uh, messages going around uh, on, on WhatsApp and the social yeah. media about what's happening and how it's happening and why it's happening. And everyone seems to have an opinion on those things. But away from that, we, we, we can start saying that, listen, that is not in our control. 
Yeah. We, what, we, the lockdown has been almost throughout the world, South Africa, India, Pakistan, UK, you know, USA, Canada, Australia, with different variations. Now that is not in our control, it is by the authorities and the ulama have said that we must um, abide by the, the regulations of the country. Mm -hmm. But what is in our control is to make the most of Ramadan. The blessedness of Ramadan remains irrespective of the circumstances, irrespective of the situation. It is still blessed. It yeah. is not that if because of lockdown it is not blessed. The blessedness will remain from Almighty Allah subhanahu sure. wa ta'ala. So what is not in our control, let us leave that. You know, okay. it's not in our control. Let us do what we can do with what is in our control. You mentioned about the private uh, aspect of Ramadan. I think we just add the collective aspect. I mean, for me personally, the way we've tried to organize ourselves is to have sessions throughout the day. So it's, it's programmed. Basically, if you have a session of praying collectively with your family, uh, in particularly the best time is just before iftar. Uh, you know, half an hour before iftar, if you can get around the table, uh, get one of your child uh, to read a certain section of a kitab and go through it. I think that also builds up. And in fact, the, all the salat now you're praying at home, it, you should make it as jama'ah uh, and tarawih as well. And that bondage of collectiveness within the family is, I think, an aspect that we never had before. And of course, it, it's not as good as going to a masjid, but to, to, to lead the salah with the family, it's, it's a spirit that you know, I've, I've never experienced in the past. So there is that the collective idea of your family, uh, the, the closer family that should be appreciated as well, I think. What do you think? Yes, I think it's amazing. And what, what I've been also telling people uh, in the programs that I've had is that just because there's a lockdown where you seem to have the freedom to be able to, to rest when you want, sleep when you want, don't get into that situation. Uh, try and, uh, and set a schedule for yourself. If you have mm -hmm. to be uh, on your table or on your desk doing something, uh, I think mm -hmm. try and be there at a particular time. Don't just sort of let the, the day go by uh, just by uh, you know, just taking it and just uh, random without, without. I think it's important. And I think maybe also the aspect of bonding with the family, uh, we're going to spend more time with the family, perhaps know one another better, perhaps be able to spend and be able to bond in such a way that has been amazing. Uh, may I dare say it also that, I mean, uh, in, in our sh Sharia, of course, the men uh, do lead the Salat and we can, of course, um, the men can at least at that time say that the husband, the wife is obeying her. Uh, obeying him when when he's going out in Ruku, Ruku, she's going to go down in Ruku and he's going to go down in Sitar, she's going to go down. <laughs> I don't know if you know, you get uh, such mm -hmm. opportunities, but of course it is there. And uh, just let me just uh, also say two points in the, from the hadith with regard to the beauty of, of ibadat in solitude. Among the seven categories that will be under Allah's shade on the day of Qiyamah, one will be Rajulan dhakar Allah khaliyan fafadat aynawu. A person who remembers Allah in solitude and his eyes tears out of the fear, out of the love of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm just wondering that in this lockdown, we've got such a beautiful opportunity to be able to, to accompany one of the categories that will be under the shade of Allah Ta'ala's throne on the day of Qiyamah. That's one point from the Hadith. And another point which uh, came to my mind, uh, you know, when we were studying, uh, our our rector, Molana Yusuf bin Nuri Rahmatullahi, used to give us a talk in the beginning of the year. And one of the points that he made mention was that um, uh, the very famous incident that Nabi Karim Sallallahu went out at the time of Tahajjud mm -hmm. and he saw Abu Bakr reading Salat in, in Tahajjud Salat and reading Salat completely in silence. So he asked him the next day, and Molana used to quote this quite a bit, and he used to say that, um, why are you reading your salat in, in silence? So he said, Asma'tu man najait. The one whom I'm reading for, he is listening to my prayer. Oh, the one whom I'm reading it for, he is listening to my prayer. So that is why I'm reading it in silence. Yeah. What an amazing thing that here, here is an opportunity to just enjoy the benefit of ibadat in solitude. Alhamdulillah. Well, now, uh, on to move on, uh, of course, we haven't got much time. And a more important aspect, and this has confused a lot of people who are thinking about it and how to consider uh, the pandemic or, or the plague uh, that we're under, the coronavirus. Do we consider it as a, a rahmah 
or do we think uh, this is some sort of a curse upon us or it's, it's a visitation or punishment? How, how, how can we read this between these two ideas that, that are floating and both exist, of course, and how can we measure that? Oh, very interesting. And I think it's, it's important for us to have a, a holistic understanding of the whole, the whole understanding thing is that on one, on one hand, we know that the Quran and Hadith speaks about the dunya being a test, the, yeah. the world being a test. Mm -hmm. And once we regard it as a test, you know, Allah khalaq al mawt wal hayat, I've created the cycle of life and death uh, to test who does righteous deeds. When ablukum bi sharri wal khairi fitna, I will test you with adverse conditions. Molana, you've just, uh, carry on, sorry, carry on. Yeah, upon the people of the past, um, they came different situations. They came difficult conditions to the to turn towards Almighty Allah. Then when they didn't turn towards Almighty Allah, Allah brought about easy conditions. So conditions in itself are not the ultimate objective. The ultimate objective is how do we respond to those situations? Oh. With ease, do you forget the Almighty who granted you those things? In difficulty and challenges, do you become despondent and forget the mercy of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah wants you to be able to see uh, what, how do you respond to the situations Allah brings upon you. So Allah will bring different situations. Now why Allah brings, again the Quran and Hadith is replete by telling us some of the reasons. Right? Sometimes it does say, I will test you with fear, apprehension, and of course, there's great amount of fear. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, loss and diminishing uh, risk and uh, sustenance. وَبَشِّرِ السَّابِرِينَ And give glad tidings to those who persevere. So as sometimes in the Quran, there is a very clear cut indication that difficulties and challenges comes as a test. Wa'id ibtala Ibrahim. We tested Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And what great test came upon him. Then we also find that Allah Ta'ala has made mention with regard to uh, difficulties and calamities and challenges coming upon human beings because of the doings of humankind. And there are many. musibatin. Surah to Shura, 25th Supara of the Quran, uh, whatever difficulty comes upon you, it is because of your doings. Zahar al Fasadu fil Barri wal Bah bima kasabat aidin nas. Corruption has appeared upon the land and upon the earth because of the doings of humankind. But what is interesting in this aspect of difficulties coming upon uh, us because of the doings of mankind is that the, in, in the end of those verses, there's always an indication that it is never in this world as an ultimate recompense. Because this dunya and this world is never supposed to be a place of ultimate recompense. We always, the scholars have always told us, the world is a place of action. The year after is a place of judgment and recompense. So it's never going to be that Allah is going to reward or fully reward or fully punish you for your doings here. So that is why in all those ayats, or most of those ayats, which speaks about uh, the calamities or difficulties coming upon people because of our doings, you'll see in the verse I quoted in Surah Rum, Sahar al-Fasadu fil barri wal bah, and the one in Alif Lam named Sijda, we will make, make you taste a minor uh, punishment prior to the major. The major one will come in the year after. In both of these verses, it is so that you might reflect and turn back to Almighty Allah. Yeah. So both these occasions, whatever difficulty comes, it is for us to start maybe taking a you know, step back and say that, listen, there is someone else who is in control over matters. Yeah. He has full control over his bondsman, over his creation. So therefore, it is for us to turn towards that power who has ultimate power and control. And we cannot afford to ignore his greatness, ignore his commands, ignore that he is the one who controls matters. And we've got to set ourselves right according to his commands. So I think 
even if it is regarded to be what we regard it as, as a, a warning, it is there for you to reflect and turn towards one Allah. So I suppose it's very much in all the scenarios that you've <clears throat> presented is how we react to it. But even if due to our past deeds, we're being punished, but why are we being punished? If we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek for his forgiveness, then this becomes a means of rahmah. And therefore, I suppose the two ideas are not in contradictions at all. Uh, it's our reaction now, and most probably even here after, after this has gone away, how do we react? Do we still remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or very quickly forget about what we've gone through and return back to our old ways? So I think in a way, overall, what this is doing, that if you absorb it in a manner that is in accordance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it becomes a rahmah. And if you don't, then obviously it's a test that you have failed. Am I right yes. in considering that? Let, let, let me give you a perfect example of how Almighty puts it in the second page of the ninth juice, in the second ruku, uh, in Surah A'raf. Uh, we sent messengers to the people of the past and we seized them and we brought upon them difficult conditions, yeah. right? Almost like a form of punishment and difficult conditions. So that they might turn towards, and they might turn towards Almighty Allah in humility. Yeah. So I think the point is that whatever it is, it, whether it is, which unfortunately we never regard as a test, which is perhaps a greater test than challenges. But just as ease is a test, I think the challenges come as a test to, to, to regard it as a test and also maybe to warn us that maybe perhaps down the line, uh, we have not been able to comply with the commands of Allah and it is uh, something that makes us to, to start thinking in that, in that regard. SubhanAllah, because what you basically saying is that this test that we're being put under is for, for us to strengthen our iman. Our yes. faith should be strengthened. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's subhanAllah, it's, it's amazing. Jazakallah for that one. But it also brings about two several other points that, you know, we have become so arrogant in our life, in our wealth, in our way of doing things. We have never considered the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here is a minuscule object, uh, you know, it's so small. Somebody was saying, you, know, you need an electron microscope to see it. Yeah, you know, such a minute thing, yet it has brought about such a destruction what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can use to humble us, uh, those who thought we had so much power, uh, uh, wealth, children, and things we could do the way we liked. So in a way, it's, it's an amazing leveler uh, between us and, and, and our own consciousness and our arrogance of power. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. You know, there is a statement of Ali radiallahu ta'ala, which I think fits this uh, time so, so aptly and appropriately. I have recognized Allah by the failure of my intention. Never mind the wealth and the power and the quadrat and everything. Just even in our in our day-to-day -day life, I mean, everyone sort of seemed to have had a schedule. Uh, yeah. Next month, I'm going for a holiday year. I'm going for Umrah year. Uh, in my own case, there were two trips of mine that were planned. I was supposed to be in Canada over the Easter weekend for a youth program. I was supposed to do a, a program. Uh, a visit uh, for the Islamic historical sites in Bosnia, you are not in control. You know, you can make your schedule. You can make your plans. There is someone above you uh, who controls your plans. And I think it's time that we also start re recognizing that wa makaru wa makar Allah. you plan and Allah Ta'ala plans and Allah is the best of planners. It also brings us closer to the idea of death, that life is not permanent. Uh, and this is being reminded in you know, all our scholars and, and the Quran is obviously replete with it, that you know, always remember death. And this, I mean, in, in a way that, that goes back to the idea of faith that it really strengthens us. Mulana, let's move on. We haven't got much time. This brings us to the other idea that, you know, we should have tawakkul. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, all these ideas, uh, if Allah has decreed upon us our fate, why bother with lockdowns and quarantines and you know medication and just to carry on with your life as normal? What would you say to that? You know, we, we all believe in the in the concept of tawakkul. He who relies upon Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah ta'ala becomes sufficient for him. Upon the Almighty should the believers 
place they trust in. So yes, they, there is this aspect of great amount of, um, and uh, you know, there is great amount of emphasis with regard to tawakkul. But what is the meaning of tawakkul? Let us look at the Quran. fil amr says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, uh, consult with the companions. So, so Allah tells Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, consult with the companions. azamta, When you have made a decision and resolved to do something, فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then rely upon Almighty Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ Allah loves those who rely upon Almighty Allah. Look at the most beautiful chronology with the how Almighty Allah puts it. Consult with the companions, come to a decision, resolve a matter, then after you have done so, then you rely upon Almighty Allah. Tawakkul has never ever meant that we uh, rely upon Almighty Allah without uh, tying our camel. And that is of course something that we normally use as a phrase, but uh, beyond the phrase is the hadith of Nabi Karim Sallallahu when a Baddu and a villager came in the presence of Nabi Karim Sallallahu and he did not tie his camel and when Nabi Karim Sallallahu told him to tie his camel, uh, he said, I'm relying upon the Almighty. And Nabi Sallallahu told him, go and tie the camel and then rely upon Almighty Allah. In the Mi'raj, our ulama tell us that when Nabi Karim Sallallahu came with Burak into Masjid Aqsa, uh, of course, even that uh, the ring is still yeah. there, uh, yeah. Malbai, that where Burak was tied. And again, there the ulama tell us that Nabi Nabi Sallallahu tied the Burak there. And he could have said that, I mean, Burak is under the commands of Almighty Allah. Why do I need to tie it? Yeah. So every time, and you know, it's, it's, it's always that you first tie the camel, you take the precaution, and then you rely upon Almighty Allah. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's very important. Uh, that also reminds me of a story of Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was heading towards uh, in, uh, Al-Sham and the Amwas uh, plague took place. Yeah. And obviously then he was told about the hadith that he should not enter that area. And he started coming back towards Medina. And then somebody said, are you running away from the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And his response is amazing. And he says that, you know what? I'm going from one Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to another Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can never escape the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you have to take the asbab. So wherever yes. I go, what is destined for me will happen and will take place. Uh, but that doesn't mean you throw yourself into the fire, as it were. And I think that's very, very important for us to remember. I think it, it, what is amazing is you look at every uh, expedition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was never an expedition that was done, uh, you know, without planning. Yeah. Every expedition, whether it was going to Tabuk, whether it was in Ohad, putting the, the, the arches in the Mount of Rumat. And one, in this regard, I think one of the most amazing incident that you can quote in this regard is Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam camped at a place in Badr. Right? Yeah. And when he came, Habib ibn Mundir, one of the companions came and said, Ya Rasulullah, are you camping here because Almighty commanded you? If Almighty commanded you, I won't say anything. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, uh, he did not command me. Allah did not tell me where I must command. I felt that this was a good place. Yeah. And Habib said, Ya Rasulullah, if, if that is the situation, can I suggest that we don't camp here? And he gave the reasons. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, you are right. Habib. And he shifted. Now, why the reasons are different matter. Mm -hmm. But just look at that aspect. I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi could have told Habib, uh, Habib, it doesn't matter where we camp. We rely upon Almighty Allah. Allah's help will come upon us whether we, whether we camp here or we camp there. Mm -hmm. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi didn't say that. He listened to him. And because the asbab, from the material point of view, mm -hmm. it made more sense to, to, to go there, Nabi Sallallahu went there and it was advantageous for the Muslims. Sure, sure. Alhamdulillah. That's very good. There's a um, very similar, something that's happened to me, I think, uh, if I might share it with the, the people who are listening to us, uh, incident about how we take things for granted and statistics. I have a foy, my uh, father's sister, mm -hmm. 92 years old. Three weeks ago, uh, she contracted uh, COVID and she got seriously ill uh, and she decided uh, she didn't want to go to the hospital. So my cousin brothers uh, had a mashwara with us and we said, you know what, she doesn't want to go. She's 92 years old. Uh, let her stay at home. Uh, the situation got so bad that uh, there was a 24 hour session where we were prepared. We had prepared everything for her, uh, that she's going to pass away and how we get the death certificate in order and things like that. 
But Alhamdulillah, she pulled through. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, just a couple of days ago, now she's uh, standing up again and eating on her own uh, way. The reason I'm narrating this is five or 10 doors away from her is another of my friend. He was 54 years old. Uh, and he also contracted uh, uh, coronavirus and he passed away. Now, what I want to say here is, you know, sometimes we might look at this as um, uh, statistical, uh, in, you know, uh, being something that happens uh, out of order. Uh, it shows us that old people should die, young shouldn't die. But here is the idea of Qadr that, you know, what you have to do is take care of yourself. But if Allah has d destined for you to pass away, then you know you're going to pass away. But that doesn't mean, you know, you go out there and, and become reckless. And, and I think, I think important point. And there's some of these examples that we have, even, even in the Amawas, which we have quoted, uh, when Umar radiallahu became extremely worried, uh, he then told the, uh, the, the Sahaba, and he told them that uh, go towards the higher ground. And Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, who took over the range of the Sahaba at that time, uh, when... Previously, it was Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, then Mu'ad ibn Jabal, uh, then Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. Then, of course, came uh, Amr ibn al As. He immediately told the people, uh, scatter yourself, go towards the mountains, um, and take the higher ground. And then that was the, uh, the, the, the diminishing and which, which led to the end of the plague. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. That, that brings us uh, to, to the next point. Now, we obviously uh, have very short memories, uh, and we always as individuals thinking about ourselves that, you know what, this is a calamity nobody has experienced through and we are the only ones going through it. In, in history, Molani, in our history, how do you see this, especially pandemic, pandemics and, and plagues being found out and how our pre pious predecessors reacted to it? You know, it's, uh, it's amazing because I, I did a series um, of seven programs on the lessons from the first plague in Islamic history and why, why I fi find it found it so interesting was, uh, and it is in one of my social media platforms, but wh wh why it's so interesting is, is that it happened to the best of Allah's creation. And the, and the lessons that you learn from there are so extraordinary uh, that, that uh, you, know, you, you, you cannot believe it. Because it speaks about how the Sahaba, such prominent Sahaba, Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah amongst the Ashra Mubashara, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala, Yazid bin Abi Sufyan, you know, the brother of Hazrat Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Shurahbil ibn Hassana, Muad ibn Jabal's entire family, his son Abdurrahman ibn Muad, an amazing incident with regard to what was the conversation between him and his son when his son contracted the pandemic and he was on his last bed, deathbed. And then Fazal ibn Abbas, the cousin of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such great companions passed away in that plague. And it's absolutely amazing to see that it's not the only time. And then, and of course, another, another uh, very interesting point was that many, many historians be, beyond the plague of Amawas also speaks about the amount of plagues that came upon the Umayyad rule. Yeah. And the Umayyad rule was for some 90, or 90, 100 years, six, from between 661 and 750. Um, uh, they, there is a recorded uh, in the history that there were something like 19 plagues that came upon them. Uh, some then, of course, say that, uh, no, this was uh, exaggerated by later historians because of the, the difference between the Umayyads and the Abbasids. But there is no doubt whatsoever. And many historians point to the amount of plagues that came in the Umayyad period. And bear in mind that that was still part of Khairu Qurun. Yeah. You know, Nabi Karim said, Khairu Qurun nikarni thumma ladina yalunahum thumma ladina yalunahum the three different generations, which is part of Khair al-Qurun, Sahaba, Tabi'in, and Taba Tabi'in, that was still in that time. And uh, what is no doubt that there were a great amount of plagues, uh, to such an extent that there is one plague known as Ta'un al-Basra. And there they talk about that in one day there was 40,000 people who lost their lives. So, you know, the thing is that these things have happened in our history. Uh, Mufti Taha Karan from, from South Africa has done most beautiful analysis with regard to the different types of plagues uh, that have come in Islamic history, at least the more major ones. So it is not something that is only upon uh, this, uh, you know, our generation. It has happened. And maybe if we look at what has happened there in terms of numbers and in terms of 
its seriousness even to a greater extent. And Allah Ta'ala make it such that this one year also comes to an end uh, without, uh, you know, as soon as possible and Allah Ta'ala bring relief to not only this Ummah but to the entire humanity. Well, Anna, that brings us to the next point. You know, uh, the issue of being in lockdown in your house with anxiety of income, uh, not knowing what the future is going to be like, that has impacted a lot of people with their mental health. And uh, you know, in, in Britain in particular, I don't know about South Africa or around the globe, but definitely in Britain, the mental health crisis has really peaked. How do we try and reassure people that, you know, or how to cope with the anxiety and the stress and the fear that, that, that people genuinely feel uh, about this issue? Uh, well, it's, 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 it, is, it is something people deal with um, isolation or maybe uh, different types of, uh, uh, differently. You know, uh, there was a study that was done by one of the social counseling services here that how people you know, deal with, uh, with um, uh, the experiences of self-isolation or experiences within uh, one's family and the fact that you are, you know, mostly isolated. Firstly, of course, I think it, it initially, uh, it starts off with a lot of optimism. It's time for myself, uh, something that I always wanted to do. I always wanted to stay uh, at home. I always found work boring. I always found it tedious, found it overwhelming. Uh, maybe not all, some people did feel like that. Here's a time for myself, almost like a holiday at home. Uh, then it became part of determination that, you know, uh, so people were determined. It didn't turn out to be as uh, optimistic as people realized. Gradually it became less uh, positive. Uh, then, of course, there was a swaying between uh, satisfaction and frustration, uh, swaying between being productive and irritated at one time. So in a day, you, you felt sometimes very productive. You felt high. You felt like doing things. And then, of course, um, uh, you, you came to a certain degree of frustration during the course of the very same day. So there was a swinging between different, um, uh, different types of feelings. Uh, then, of course, certain aspects of depression, feeling hopeless, uh, bored, uh, restless. Uh, then, of course, some, sometimes it also could lead to anger about the situation, especially when it is extended. Uh, and sometimes it also to do uh, acceptance. So you start thinking that well, some things are in your control and some things are out of your control. So I think that is also some of the things that come upon. And then, of course, you start, which is, of course, one of the, the, the ways of dealing with it is to make meaning. Yeah. It's necessary for the greater good. Start to do something constructive for oneself and the family. Make a meaning out of what the situation is. So you have these different and phases of uh, feelings and emotions that come uh, because of lockdown and it is important that we always realize that situations come from almighty allah it is the way we respond uh, that that uh, can make it meaningful can make it rewarding or it could be otherwise negative so in effect i mean you know it's difficult to tell somebody who who is going through all this but it's a time to rediscover yourself uh, it is time to think about the wider community and the family rather than being individualistic uh, and I think if you look outwards on how you can help others, I think it's something that can be very beneficial. And I think we touched about this earlier, that it is also a means of making dawah, because this is a time when you get engaged in the society and the needs of the others. I think not only does it deflect the, your concerns, but you become uh, an asset to, to the community. And therefore, being seen as a Muslim, uh, it is a means of making dawah without actually saying or inviting people to Islam? You know, it, it's, it's amazing. I mean, uh, <laughs> there's been so many things that, that you can learn from this. First of all, I mean, I, I have never ever had such, such intense meetings over Zoom, uh, even perhaps even uh, in face-to-face -face meetings, I never had such intense meetings and making such major decisions, uh, coming to terms with regard to it. So yes, you, you know, all of, all of a sudden you are working from home, uh, there are different, uh, different styles of meetings, change in bus business practices, supply chain. Uh, it's a whole new dimension. A another point that, uh, you know, we can look at it from a completely, you know, look at it from one beautiful perspective is 
uh, the men folk uh, having a new respect for mothers yeah. uh, who stay home with little kids all the time. Uh, you never realized how challenging it can be uh, to keep a child mm -hmm. occupied. Uh, and it is something that all of a sudden comes to you and you realize that, uh, you know, uh, the mother has been, uh, well, it, it might be a little bit different in different societies, but of course, uh, the mother still plays a major role in terms of um, uh, terms. taking the, the, yeah. the responsibility of, of looking after the children. Now, all of a sudden, you can see that, that there's a, the newfound respect for spouses uh, who stay home with little kids all the time. So, yes, I think, you know, it, it can become frustrating. As I said, that there are these different phases. You can start off being optimistic, and then you can start off being swaying between frustration and uh, being uh, productive, depression, feeling hopeless, anger about the situation, then a certain degree of acceptance. But in all of this, I think we have to find meaning. We cannot let it weigh down upon us. Uh, and and, and it, there are different situations that come upon us. It's, 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 it's the human being that makes the best out of the situations that come upon him. Sure. And uh, uh, it might be easier said than done, but of course there are many positive things that I have heard from people when they have spoken about some of the things that, you know, just, just the fact of reading Salat with, with your children, yeah. uh, being able to enjoy uh, uh, an extended iftar with your with your children and your family, where normally it is um, just having maybe a kajur or maybe having a kajur at the masjid with a few people. So yes, yes, I know that it can lead to to, to depression, and we should never underestimate that. Be be aware with regard to it, but also look at uh, the many pro positive aspects that uh, can come about because of what is happening. Mola, we've talked about uh, individualism, uh, becoming conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's one aspect that is very sad in Britain. Uh, you know, we've had uh, nearly 4,000 deaths in our care homes. Uh, and basically, a care home is a euphemism of keeping our parents there when the children are not, not taking care of them. Now, this obviously comes in a society that is moved from the traditional to what they call a nuclear family. Now the societal structure, we're not going to be able to change overnight, but how do you feel that Muslims can bring about an introduction of respect for our parents and bring about that traditional feel to the community rather than the individualism that we have so much become accustomed to? Uh, and, and what are your thoughts around that? You know, this is one of the amazing aspects with regard to, to the Quran and the Islamic approach mm -hmm. to this matter is that um, when we look at the Holy Quran, Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about the parents, uh, Almighty Allah says, and whenever Allah ta'ala describes our relationship with our parents, it's always, or by and large always, um, coupled with our relationship with Allah. So in Surah Bani Israel, Almighty decrees that you should worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you should be kind towards your parents. Uh, then Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Anishkur li wali walide. Be kind to me and be, be grateful to me and be grateful to your parents. Yeah. Now, obviously, when, when, when parents become uh, elderly, uh, there is a certain degree of been set in their ways, right, which is bound to happen. I mean, they've been living a way which is almost 60, 70 years. You cannot change it because of the changing circumstances that you might be aware of, that they, they might not be aware of. So Allah says, mm. If one of them or both of them reach old age, don't even say off to them in disrespect, doesn't say don't speak to them, obviously speak to them, but not in contempt. Yeah. And that word, uf, as Ali radiallahu ta'ala used to, when he translated and he gave a commentary of this verse, used to say that uf is any expression of contempt, any expression of displeasure. Uh, I wonder if in today's time, Ismail, well, you know, if you find our children, when you tell them something that they're not happy with and they want to sort of do a protest march against the parents, they say, <laughs> ah. And I wonder that where, where that ah is the equivalent of the uf, which is mentioned in the, in the Holy Quran. Uh, so Allah Ta'ala says that when one of them or both of them become old, don't even say uf to them. Now, then just look at the different, the different perspectives. 
many times the, the contemporary world will tell us that yes, they have become an unnecessary burden upon us. Uh, you know, they have become difficult. They are, they are set in their ways. I can't deal with them. Uh, therefore, let us put them away into to, to homes. Uh, that is how many a times people would look upon it. Uh, and I always wonder, and so, you know, ulama normally make mention of this, that sometimes it's so amazing uh, that a mother will look after six children or, or five children or four children, whatever it is. And when she becomes old, four or five children can't look after one mother. It's sometimes it is a fair indictment upon the way we, we, we look upon in the selfish society that the, that the capitalist uh, society breeds. But uh, so people look upon it that they are, they are difficult, they are burdened. But look at how, the, how Nabi Karim Sallallahu said, Raghima Anfu, Raghima Anfu. May that person be destroyed. May his nose be rubbed into the ground. And there was an expression in Arabic uh, to say, may he be disgraced. Ya Rasulullah, who are you referring to? Who are you referring to? That person who finds one or both of his parents in old age and he fails to gain Jannah by serving them. Now, just look at the contrast. The one contrast says that, you know, they're an unnecessary burden. Uh, just take them and put them in a way home so that you are absolved of the responsibility. And the other one says that you be disgraced if you don't take this as an opportunity to gain your Jannah. I, 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 I can't explain the two contrasts more greater than the way Nabi Karim has, has expressed it. It's just absolutely phenomenal. So here, here's an opportunity really for us not to just make dawah, but to change the social structure that we live around and by practicing it, of course. I mean, there's no point talking about theory, but by practicing it. Uh, and hopefully, so we can learn from that. Well, Anna, we haven't got very much time, so I'm gonna give you a last question we're gonna talk about is unfortunately people who have coronavirus or get coronavirus, uh, especially if they pass away, they, they seem to hide it. Uh, they think there's a stigma against it. Uh, and, and it's sometimes inbuilt, sometimes it's a reflection of the society's approach to people. How, what's your advice to them? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that um, uh, when, when Malikul Mot was given the task by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take over and do the responsibility of taking the lives of people, and of course, we know that is a very famous incident that um, he said that, Ya Allah, people will hate me. Mm. And um, he, when he was said that people will hate me, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, people won't hate you. People will never refer the fact that you are the one Just who is working according to my commands. And I have commanded you to do such a thing. People will refer it to the illness or the reasons or the means for which people will pass on. Yeah. And uh, so people will say, this person died because of um, a, a heart attack, or they will say that he passed away because of a kidney failure, or sometimes it will happen because he passed away in an accident. I mean, to, 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 to pass away due to COVID is part of the very same means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses uh, to, to effect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision. So there are two aspects here. One aspect is that we look at the periphery and we look at the external. And one is we look at the, the major factor, right? The real reason. One is apparent reason, one is a real reason. The apparent reason is a person passes away because of a heart attack, because of dialysis, because of COVID-19, because of a motor car accident. And of course, the host of reasons why a person passes away, that's the apparent reason. The real reason is when a time comes for a person to leave, it is not brought forward a moment, it is not delayed a moment. Uh, I have full control over my bondsman. When the time of death comes, I send my messenger. Now that messenger could be Malikul Mot, it could be heart attack, it could be your COVID-19. It's Allah's messenger to bring about the decision of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. I can't see the reason that from an Islamic perspective, someone can have a stigma towards a person who is infected by, by COVID-19, you know, infected or affected by COVID-19. It's something that 
I, I, you know, you fail to grasp the wisdom. Is it because of community pressure? Is it because of our so social or our customs that come from uh, our traditional ways? Or is it from an Islamic perspective? Definitely not from an Islamic perspective. Also, I wanted you to touch on the idea of the person who passes away uh, under a pandemic or, or a plague, that their status is one of a martyrdom. That is an amazing thing. You know, I, I, I failed to make mention of this hadith at the time when you asked about the plague. There is one specific hadith that relates to ta'un and plague. Now the word ta'un, the ulama have written that, you know, there's difference between ta'un and waba. Uh, ta'un is more specific, waba is more general. Uh, but be as it may, uh, what, what, what Nabi Karim sallallahu was one day questioned by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. And Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala was always amazing because she used to ask such uh, delicate and such uh, leading questions, which open up the doors of and avenues and doors of knowledge that, uh, that uh, she brought because of her insightful and incisive questions. So she asked Nabi Karim Sallallahu about Ta'un and about uh, the, the plagues. And Nabi Karim Sallallahu said, it is a rahmat for the believer. It is a punishment for those who, who do not take to the lessons but it is a rahmat for the believer. And then Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made mention, whoever dies in that, he dies as a shaheed. The, the ulama have made mention, five people die as a shaheed. Yeah. Al-Maptoon shaheed. I don't have the exact, maybe I might not get the exact number. One of them, a person who dies out of a stomach illness, a person who drowns, a person who, who is crushed uh, by a building or a building comes down upon him. And one of them is a person who passed away in a plague. He is a shaheed. And in this regard, you know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it's not this. I, must, I must relate this incident. It's just, it's just too beautiful. Hazrat Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Nabi Karim sallallahu had predicted about the ta'un, ta'un amwar. So Nabi Karim sallallahu said, count six things between me and, and Qiyamat. Count six things between me and Qiyamat. And one of them was a plague will come upon you when you are in Syria. So when, and then Nabi Karim Sallallahu did give glad tidings that the people who pass away in that plague, they will get the rank of a shaheed. Yeah. They will get the rank of a martyr. So Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to make this dua, Ya Allah, uh, I got the opportunity to be part of being a shaheed. So when, when according to what, what we read in history was that that plague of Amawas, uh, when it manifested, there used to be a small boil that used to come upon the body of, of those who were, um, you know, infected by the plague of the time. So when he saw that, which was a sign of the plague, in that time there was no, there was no known cure for it. Amazingly, he used to kiss the boil. He used to kiss the boil. And he used to say, I would not substitute you for anything of this world. I would not substitute you for anything of this world because the Nabi of Allah told us that a plague will come and those who die in the plague, they will get the rank of a shaheed. And here is my means of you know, getting into a rank of a shaheed. He used to kiss it saying, I, don't, I won't substitute you for anything. You know, there is, when, he, when his son Abdul Rahman uh, you know, got got this, uh, he went to his son and he asked him, how do you feel? And the son said, you know, uh, I, I, I'm happy with the decision of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the same was that Mu'ad uh, bin, bin Jamal radiallahu ta'ala recited the verse which Ismail alayhi salatu was salam recited when his father Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam told him that uh, I'm going to sacrifice you. And he says, Satajiruni insha'Allah min as now the historians have got both narrations. Some said the father said it, or some said the, uh, the, the son said it. They said, Sata Jiruni, you will find with the will of Almighty Allah, we will persevere with regard to uh, the plague that we find ourselves in. I, I think it's just volumes of lesson. And that is why Nabi Karim Sawasam said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnatul khulafai rashidin. And he said, Ashabi kan nujum. That in the life of the Sahaba, you find, you know, these guiding stars to, to light up your life and illuminate your life. That if you find yourself in a similar situation, what can you do? It's just amazing how they, they looked upon it. And if there is someone 
who is infected by it, or there are families who are affected by it. I think they should just take so much of solace from what the Sahaba Ikram radiallahu ta'ala who went through when there was at the time of Amwas. And there are these narrations that say almost close to, you know, a couple of hundreds of Sahaba who passed away in that plague. Just to, to recap, um, basically, you know, we've gone through uh, your, your experience and your knowledge, alhamdulillah, Allah, extend your shadow upon us, Molana. Uh, I mean, so based in, in, a, in a summary that, you know, what we have been experiencing, we should take it uh, as the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, derive benefit by becoming positive, uh, becoming, having a greater faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, becoming conscious of our role, uh, becoming positive ambassadors for Islam. Uh, and if unfortunately we pass away, this is something we should consider as a martyrdom, the highest rank that a Muslim could ever wish. Uh, and of course, we should not do, go for it, uh, volunteer for it. But if it does uh, come to us, our members of our family, then we should be thinking that we've been blessed uh, and our, our uh, families, members who've been inflicted, uh, have been raised in the hereafter to a higher rank. Mulana Jazakallah Khan, uh, any final words uh, from you to, to our viewers? I think, I think one, one of the points that is so important also is that, you know, we, we, you get a time to be more with your family. And of course, I know that it can reach, uh, you know, also come into strain relationship because of the pressure of social isolation. Sometimes frustration are easily misdirected to the spouse and the children can get caught up because of their, their vulnerability. But let's look at it the positive side couples could use the time as an opportunity to reconnect, understand and reconcile their differences. They could sit down and understand one another better. They could get together and understand the, 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 the likes and the dislikes of one another. Mm -hmm. I always find this amazing that when Nabiya Karim said, that I know when you are happy with me and I know when you are not so happy with me. And Aisha was just sitting absolutely amazed the greatest human being in Allah's creation telling him, I know when you are happy and I know when you're not so happy. How do you know, Ya Rasulullah? In your conversation, you say that um, by the, when you are happy, you take an oath by the Lord of uh, Muhammad. And when you're not so happy, you say by the Lord of Ibrahim. I wonder how many of us know the likes and dislikes of our family, our spouse. What, what ticks them? What, what makes them happy? What colors they like? I mean, here the Prophet of Almighty Allah, the greatest human being, could buy a conversation of Aisha pick up that things are all smooth and when things are not so smooth, just by the, the way she expressed herself, subhanAllah. And I think there's such a wonderful opportunity that we can even use together with building our relationship with Allah, build our relationship with our spouses also. Zakalak uh, Molana, make it maybe a small dua also to the listeners. If you want to leave a note to see how you found this, uh, or we can improve on this in the future as well, that will also be appreciated. Make a small dua Molana, and then we, we end it. اللهم لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم يا الله يا رحم الراحمين يا أول الأولين يا آخر الآخرين يا رحم الضعفاء والمساكين يا الله هف مسيح ونسي الله يا الله this is the عشرة of mercy يا الله يا الله do not deprive us of your mercy يا الله Ya Allah, your mercy is great, Ya Allah. There is a barrier between us and receiving your mercy, and that is the mercy of our sins. Ya Allah, remove our sins, Ya Allah. Remove our sins not because we are worthy of our sins being removed, but because you love forgiveness, Ya Allah. You have said, Allahumma inna ka'afoon kareemun tuhibbu al-affa fa'afu anna. Your Nabi made dua this. Ya Allah, you love forgiveness, Ya Allah. Forgive us. Ya Allah, our sins are many, Ya Allah, but your forgiveness is even greater. Allah wa maghfiratuka, awsa'u min dunubina. O Allah, your maghfirat is far more vast than our sins. Ya Allah, you have gripped humanity in something that we cannot understand. We do not know the wisdom. Ya Allah, you know the wisdom, Ya Allah. Whatever the wisdom, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, let us pay heed to those wisdoms, Ya Allah. If it is for us to reflect, let us reflect. If it is for us to mend our ways, let us mend our ways. Ya Allah, whatever it is, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we are weak, Ya Allah. We have we had a very high notion of ourselves. Yeah. We felt that things are happening because of our acumen, because of our strength, because of our power, because of our ability. Ya Allah, you have showed us that you are in control over the universe. Ya Allah, ulama always told us Maliki Yomid Deen means the one 
who is the master of the day of judgment because on the day of judgment, no one will be able to speak. No one will be able to utter a whisper. But they said, Allah, you are the controller of this world, but here in this world, you give us a small degree of freedom. Allah, we must use that freedom. Allah. We felt that we are the masters and we are the owners of our destiny. Allah, we have learned this lesson, Ya Allah. We are not the owners of our destiny, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, you own us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, warhamna. Let us end this dua with this beautiful dua that our fires used to make dua. Warhamna bi qudratika alayna. Allah, have mercy upon us because of the power that you have over us, Ya Allah. Mm -hmm. Have mercy over us because of the power that you have over us. And may Allah Ta'ala be with us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, you be with us in every walk of our life. وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين برحمتك يا رب جزاك الله خير for joining us inshallah and keep on remembering us in your dua